All right, guys, welcome to the first question video for organic chemistry. In this, we'll go over questions one to five. So question one is asking us into which, which solvent would the following compound most easily dissolve? So the compound that we have here, we need to look at its properties. And then for it to dissolve in a solvent, it needs to match those properties. So if our compound is very hydrophobic, we want to look for something that's a hydrophobic solvent and vice versa for something that is polar. When we look at our compound, we see a lot of carbons and we especially see that we have these aromatic rings. So six carbons, a lot of hydrogens there as well. So for the most part, this compound is pretty hydrophobic, but then we have to keep in mind that we have oxygens. And so in the oxygen, we do have a dipole moment going towards the oxygen in the bond that's between the carbon and oxygen. So we have a delta negative on the oxygen, delta positive on the carbon that's attached to it. So the main point here is that we do have a dipole moment. So the molecule does have some polarity. So it's mainly hydrophobic, but there is some polarity. So the thing that would be best for dissolving this is something which is an organic solvent, but it can dissolve polar substances. So we don't want to use water. That would be incorrect. That's for something that's largely polar and aqueous, but this compound is organic and it has some polarity, but it's more so hydrophobic. So water would not be good. Ether, that would be an all right choice because it's an organic solvent. It can dissolve polar solutes, so that is good. Hexane would not be good. It is an organic solvent, but it's just a carbon chain of six carbon, so it's all hydrophobic. But this molecule does have some polarity. So if we had just a hydrophobic molecule without those oxygens, hexane would be a good choice. But in this case, because of the polarity, ether would be better. And then H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide, that's similar to water. It also dissolves polar compounds, and hydrogen peroxide is usually, when it's bought as a reagent, is usually dissolved in an aqueous solution. So it would be the same as water. And so the best solvent would be ether, once again, because it's an organic solvent and because it has polarity to it. In question two, we're asked which of the following amino acids does not have a polar side chain. So for this, you need to have all the side chains of the different amino acids memorized. And then you should also know based on what groups they have, if they're polar, if they're hydrophobic, and so on. And so this question is really just one of memorization. And if you have these side chains memorized, you will know that serine, threonine, and asparagine all three of these, they have an oxygen in their side chain. And what we're asked in the question is which of the following amino acids does not have a polar side chain? So we're looking for something that is not polar, meaning that it's hydrophobic. So let's just go over here and look at these figures for amino acids. Which ones do we have? Asparagine. That is over here. So asparagine, you can see that its side chain has an amide, and an amide is a carbonyl, so it's definitely going to be polar. And then we were also talking about serine and threonine. Yeah, they're right beside it. So threonine, it has an OH group, and then so does serine. So since all of these have either an oxygen or a nitrogen, they are, as a result of that, polar. And then the one which was nonpolar, that was leucine. So let's just find leucine over here. Here we have leucine. It's in the bottom group with hydrophobic side chains. So leucine has that isovalent group or yeah, the isobutyl group and it's all carbons and hydrogen. So because we don't have an electronegative atom there like oxygen or nitrogen or sulfur, therefore it's not a polar side chain. And so this is a hydrophobic amino acid. So that's why leucine is going to be our correct answer for question two. In question three, it says cis-1,2-difluoroethene is also known as what? So for this, we need to know the different nomenclature for organic compounds. So let's just draw this out. The F part of the name tells us that we have two carbons, and then the E part tells us that it's a double bond. So it will look like this. And then on carbon one and on carbon two, we have a fluoro telling me that I have a fluoride. So I put one on each of them and then 
Therefore, it's implied that everything else is filled with hydrogens. So this is what the compound looks like. And a key part of the name is that it's cis. So that nomenclature, cis and trans, tells us the groups that we have on the double bond, which orientation are they relative to each other. So if they're cis, that means that they're on the same side. So you can see that both the fluorides are in that top position. And trans would mean that they're on opposite sides. So that would look like this if one was at the top and the other one was at the bottom. So since they're cis, they look like the compound up here at the top. And so another way of naming this, instead of saying cis or trans, for double bonds, you can say E or Z, and it means the same thing. E represents trans, which means that they would be on opposite sides, and you should know that Z represents them being on the same side or cis. And one way of memorizing that is that Z sounds kind of like on the same side. So just remember that for them being on the same side. And then cis also is on the same side and trans is on opposite sides. So E would be incorrect. And R and S are also incorrect because that's not even a naming convention that we use for double bonds. That's when we're talking about stereochemistry and we're talking about orientation in 3D space. So that's when I have, for example, like a tetrahedral molecule, and then I can have orientation around 3D space, whereas double bonds are planar, and it's more so not really their orientation like in space moving around, but if I have a plane, and then it's something can be facing one way or the other way, which way do they face relative to each other? So R and S are for a different set of compounds, therefore we can eliminate C and D. In question four, we're asked which of the following carbocations is least stable. So we have carbocations, which means we have a carbon with a positive charge in all of these options, and we're asked which one is least stable. So the rule that you should know with carbocations is the ones that are the most substituted are the most stable. So with carbocations, what's happening is carbon would like to have four bonds, but unfortunately it only has three. So that means it has less electrons than it would like, and it has an overall positive charge. And species don't like to be charged, so therefore they would like to find something to counteract that charge or get rid of that charge. So if carbon wants to get rid of the charge and it doesn't have electron density, it therefore wants more electron density to get rid of the positive charge. So what happens is that even though the carbon-hydrogen bond is really normally not that polar, now because the carbon really does want electron density, it's going to start pulling it from everything that it's attached to. So in all these carbocations, carbon is pulling electron density to what it's attached to. So in the first one, it's pulling it from these hydrogens. In the second one, it's pulling it from the hydrogen again, but then also from these groups as well. So this group over here, this methane, here you have a carbon and then all the electrons associated with it, as well as the hydrogens that it's bonded to. So it's a lot more electron density than with just a lone hydrogen, which just has one electron. And then as we go down, all of them have extra carbons. So in C, we have two methyl groups. In B, we have one methyl group, but then we also have this ethyl group. And then in D, we have the most electron density. That carbocation in D has three benzyl groups around it, or sorry, three phenyl groups and all of them. So they have like six carbons along with all the hydrogens there. And phenyl groups are known to have a lot of electron density. That's just a general thing that you should know about them. So with all of B, C, and D, there is a decent amount of electron density for the carbocation to pull in. And so since it has that electron density, then it's not as bothered by having that positive charge. And so it can be stable for a little while. Whereas in A, that carbocation barely has any electron density around it. It can only really pull it from those hydrogens. And so it's not satisfied and it's not going to be stable at all. So that carbocation is immediately, as soon as it's formed, going to go and react and come to something more stable. So therefore, the least stable in this question is going to be option A. And once again, just understand this is all because of electron density. In question five, we're asked, which of the following functional groups has the most stable conjugate base? So we're talking about conjugate base here. So anytime you have an acid, when that acid reacts as an acid and then 
loses its protons or whatever definition of acids we're talking about. When it reacts as an acid, the resulting species is now the conjugate base. So that species has some ability to act as a base. And then if the acid lost a proton, the base can grab a proton and go back. We have that equilibrium. So if we're asked which of the following has the most stable conjugate base, that means that this conjugate base stays around for a little while, which means that if we have an equilibrium going between the acid and the conjugate base, well, it's really not a balanced equilibrium. It goes more so to the right because we get the conjugate base and then it's stable, meaning it doesn't really react and go back to the left. So if we have something which has a very stable conjugate base, that means we are also saying that we have something which is a strong acid. So in this question, another way to think about it is which one of these is the strongest acid. So an alkyne group, that would be if I had a triple bond and then one side had a negative charge, this would be the conjugate base. An alkene group would be a double bond with a negative charge. A carboxylic group, that's when we're talking about a carboxylic acid. It would look like this. And then an alcohol group would look like this. And so of these, the ones that is most stable is the one in which the proton can be most easily removed. With a triple bond, it's not easy to remove the proton at all, so or relative to the other ones. It is more easy than, say, an alkene, but it's still not that easy to remove a, a proton from an alkyne group. So if we have this negatively charged triple bond, it's going to go and react and it's going to be a strong base. So we can't say that is the most stable conjugate base. So we're asking which one is the weakest base. And then the alkene group, similarly, if you rip away a proton from a double bond, you need a very strong reagent to do that. And then this resulting base is very strong and it has a very high desire to go and grab another proton. So it's gonna grab another proton, be a strong base again. And then between a carboxylic acid and an alcohol group, you should know that carboxylic acids are more stable. So both of these can be generally stable, but we often in organic chemistry see alcohol groups act as bases. So the O, o minus in the alcohol, that OH, it can go and act as a base, but we almost never really see this carboxylate go and just act as a base on its own, unless we're really talking about kind of like an equilibrium, like when we talk about acetic acid and the buffer that we can form from it. But another clue for this is that you should know that when we talk about all the different carbonyls, the one that we say is the most stable or the least reactive is the carboxylate, which is the deprotonated carboxylic acid. And the reason for this is resonance. So once this carboxylate is formed, what happens is this negative charge donates into the carbonyl and then it's moved over to the other oxygen. So what that would look like is this. So the negative charge in the carboxylate is shared between the two oxygens, whereas that negative charge isn't really shared between atoms in any of the other options that were given. So the carboxylic acid, that produces the most stable base, and it also is the strongest acid of the options given. So due to that, those two answers give us the right answer. They allow us to choose. There are two ways of looking at what the right answer is to this question, and then they allow us to choose the correct option of the ones given. So C would be the correct answer for question five. So that's it for the questions for this video. And we just want to remind you that we have a course up on teachable.com. And in that course, we go through a lot of different things like like schedules and we explain how I got a 99 percentile on my MCAT so we go through schedules we also have lessons delivering the different topics so that you actually understand what you need to just at the level that the MCAT needs you to and we don't make it way too complicated and then most importantly we have a lot more questions in the course so if you enjoyed what you saw here me going through different questions and breaking down what the question is asking as well as why the answer is correct and why the other options are incorrect then make sure to check out our course in the description below. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next video.